Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me from my blog, The Voice for Liberty, that's on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. The motto there is individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and economic freedom in Kansas and Wichita. If you'd like to learn more about the issues covered today or to contact me, well, please visit wichitaliberty.org. Subscribe to the email newsletter, like The Voice for Liberty on Facebook, or follow me, Bob Weeks, on Twitter. We've had some fascinating guests the past month of Sundays here on Wichita Liberty TV. Last week it was Joseph Ashby and Andy Hoosier, two local radio talk show stars, talking about presidential politics. The week before that it was Brian Riley, an economist with the Heritage Foundation, who explained concepts about foreign trade and why free trade is so important. And before that, David Bob, the president of the Bill of Rights Institute, and before that, local journalist and novelist Bud Norman. I'm grateful that I can bring such outstanding guests to the Wichita Liberty TV studios. You can view these and other previous episodes at kgpt26.com or at the Voice for Liberty, wichitaliberty.org. There have also been some important events recently. On Saturday, March 5th, Kansas held its presidential caucuses, both for Republicans and Democrats. Now, a caucus is a method that some states use to select delegates for the national party conventions later this summer. Many states hold primary elections where voters go to polling places on election day and cast the secret ballots to indicate their preference for their party's presidential nominee and maybe for other offices too. These primary elections usually have advanced voting by mail opportunities. But elections are expensive. In Kansas, it is thought that a primary election would cost the state about $1 million. In order to avoid that expense, the state simply decides not to hold a presidential primary election. So the parties, in this case the Democratic and Republican parties, they hold a caucus instead of a primary election. So what's the difference? Well, first of all, a caucus is held on one day, usually during a specific time period of just a few hours. And if you want to participate in the caucus, you have to go to your caucus location at that scheduled time. There is no absentee balloting, advance voting, or anything like that. And typically at a caucus event, voters will hear from representatives of candidates or sometimes the candidates themselves. Then voting takes place. Generally, and specifically in Kansas, Republican caucus attendees vote using secret ballots. Here, at least in Kansas, you're given a paper ballot and you mark your choice and place it in a box. In many states, Democratic caucuses use a system where supporters of candidate A go stand in one corner of the room, supporters of candidate B go to another corner, and so forth like that. And it can get complicated because many states have a viability threshold whereby to get any delegates at all, a candidate must have at least some minimum percentage of support. So at a Democratic caucus, if your selected candidate does not have enough support to meet the viability threshold, well, you'll need to select a different candidate to support. And there will be persuasion applied. Well, in Sedgwick County, we had a Republican caucus. It was held at Century 2 in downtown Wichita, one caucus site for the second largest county in Kansas. Now, the largest county in Kansas, that is Johnson County, had nine caucus sites. As a result, the Sedgwick County caucus site was crowded. The trade-off is that with so many potential voters in one location, actual presidential candidates might visit the caucus site. 
And that is what happened in Sedgwick County. Both Donald Trump and Ted Cruz made speeches here in Wichita to caucus goers. And there was cheering and boos. Donald Trump also had a, held a rally of his own right before the caucus in a different venue at Century 2. So if you like a lot of political action, political theater, Saturday was a good day in Wichita. On the other hand, if you just wanted to cast a vote for your presidential preference and then go about your Saturday chores and business, well, you might have a different opinion. Because if you arrived at the caucus site before about 9.30 a.m., lines were short. But after that, there were reports that people had to wait two or three hours in line in order to vote. Well, in the end, about 6,700 people voted in the Sedgwick County Caucus, which also included Kingman and Harper Counties. At this site, Wichita, 62% voted for Ted Cruz, 20% for Donald Trump, and 13% for Marco Rubio. Statewide in Kansas, it was 48% for Cruz, 23% for Trump, 17% for Rubio, and 11 for John Kasich. Ted Cruz earned 24 delegates to the summer convention, Trump 9, Rubio 6, and Kasich 1. Well, for Kansas Democrats in their Kansas caucus on Saturday, Bernie Sanders received 68% of the votes and Hillary, Hillary Clinton 32%. Sanders earned 23 delegates and Clinton 10. Well, Democrats use proportional primaries or caucuses in which candidates receive delegates in proportion to the votes they receive. Republican primaries and caucuses start out that way, but starting this week on March 15th, states move to a winner-take-all system in which the candidate who gathers the most primary votes in a state receives all of the state's delegates. Did I say it was complicated? Well, I've left out the really complicated parts. But the purpose of all this activity is to select delegates to attend the summer political party conventions. That is, to select delegates who are committed to candidates based upon the results of a state's primary or caucus. Now, in most years, each party has a candidate who has earned an overwhelming majority of delegates by the end of the primary and caucus season, and the nominating convention in the summer is merely a formality, not much drama or excitement. But that may not be the case this year, particularly for the Republican Party. It may very well be that no candidate will have earned a majority of delegates, so no candidate will be able to be nominated on the first ballot. In that case, we have an open convention, in which case delegates from the states will be free to vote for any candidate, candidate they like on the second and subsequent ballots. And if you've watched all the episodes of season four of the Netflix political drama House of Cards, well, you've seen an idea of how chaotic a political convention can be. I think I can tell you that without spoiling the plot for anyone. Well, as you can see, a lot of effort and expense goes into selecting our next president. And that is wrong. It should not matter much who is our president. That is, if we had a constitutional government, a limited government, a government limited to doing just the things that are enumerated in the Constitution, a government dedicated to protecting our rights, well, being the president wouldn't be such a big deal. Neither would being a representative, a senator, or a bureaucrat. None of that would be such a big deal. Jeffrey Tucker of the Foundation for Economic Education, you remember him from last October when he appeared on Wichita Liberty TV, he recently wrote this. Limited government means that no matter how bad a person is who holds office, he or she lacks the tools necessary to inflict a great damage on the population. Under a small government with limited and well-defined powers, Americans are safer, not because a good guy won the election, but because the institutions he or she controls cannot be used as tools of oppression. This is what the old liberals meant when they spoke of a government of laws and not of men. Well, in a similar line of thought, Walter E. Williams wrote, The kind of rules we should have are the kind that we'd make if our worst enemy were in charge. 
Now think about how liberating this is. No matter how much you may despise, say, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, if the powers of the presidency were properly limited, there's not much either could do to hurt us, our economy, our personal liberties, or our country. With a properly, lim properly limited government, megalomaniacs like these would not be attracted to the presidency and other political offices. Yeah, we would still have campaigns and elections for president and other offices. But you know how it seems like each election, particularly presidential election, is billed as historic. How we're told that the future of the country is at stake, and we've got to fight for our future. Well, with a properly limited government, elections would be much less important. Think about this again, the words of Walter Williams, if you would. The kind of rules we should have are the kind we'd make if our worst enemy were in charge. Now, for the party that is in the minority, that is appealing. The minority naturally wants protection from the abuses and tyrannies that the majority may impose. But this goes both ways. We need restraint by the majority. The majority should not seek to apply laws and rules that oppress the minority because the majority will not always be so. For example, for the past 50 years in Kansas, whenever there has been a change of governor, the new governor has been from the opposite party. The only exception is Lieutenant Governor Mark Parkinson serving the remainder of the term of Kathleen Sebelius after she resigned. Now, does this mean that the next governor of Kansas will be a Democrat? Well, no, not necessarily. But it means that Republicans ought to govern and pass laws and regulations as though the next governor, legislature too for that matter, will be from the Democratic Party. But I don't sense that many Kansas Republicans have this frame of mind. It takes a mindset that values the long term, not short term political gain and aggrandizement. And I think it takes humility to forsake short-term political power in favor of nurturing institutions and systems that will serve our state and country in the long run. But we don't have limited government. We have, generally, government that is expanding, although there are exceptions now and then. And the power of government attracts people to seek office and power. Some of these people, many of these people, they do not have your best interests as their goal. And because of this, yes, it does matter who is president. It does matter who represents us in Congress and who is our governor and mayor, all the other political offices. All of this makes a difference. So therefore, yeah, you do need to pay attention to politics and be involved in the process. If you are not, someone else will make decisions for you and you may not like the results. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. The city of Wichita is considering creating a new regulatory regime for massage businesses. During a presentation to the Wichita City Council in February, police officials reported on a number of investigations and arrests. In 2015, they told the council there were 22 arrests for human trafficking and other violations. The presentation did not include what the other violations were, nor did it contain any information about the disposition of these cases. Well, if the city of Wichita is concerned about prostitution and child trafficking, the latter being a serious crime, well, we already have strong laws concerning this. And as far as the two crimes being related, if you are a prostitute or promoter as such, well, you are already a criminal according to the law. Committing more crimes, therefore, is just another step down the path you've already chosen. A solution is to bring prostitution out of the shadows. Stop making consensual behavior between adults a crime. Then police can focus on actual and serious crime 
like child trafficking. But the zeal of the Wichita City Council for creating a new regulatory regime is likely to overwhelm any rational thought about the problem. As a result, Wichita massage business owners and therapists are likely to be saddled with onerous licensing requirements. To become a newly licensed therapist, you must possess one of several educational credentials, one of which is 500 hours of training. An existing therapist must meet similar requirements. Now, city officials note that the existing local massage industry re requested these regulations, and that's not surprising. The purpose of nearly all occupational licensure laws is to restrict industry to the in entry to the industry so that existing practitioners can charge higher rates. And I find it both shocking and disappointing to realize that Wichita City bureaucrats and council members do not realize these economic realities. Well, another economic reality is that when licensing requirements are strict, the quality of service that many people receive declines. When investigating the demand for licensed plumbers, researchers found that when strict licensure requirements make plumbers expensive, more people do their plumbing work themselves, and that work is likely to be of a lower quality. Now it's quite a stretch, literally and figuratively, to apply this reasoning to do-it-yourself massage but here's another economic reality. The more difficult it is to achieve a credential, the greater incentive to cheat. You don't have to search very far before you find vendors advertising fake but realistic certificates and transcripts for many licensed occupations, including massage therapists. Now, how diligently will Wichita's bureaucratic machinery investigate when presented with a fake diploma certificate and transcript for a potential massage therapist? The city's record is not good in this regard. After the city passed new taxicab regulations a few years ago, somehow the regulation that prohibited convicted sex offenders from receiving licenses was not implemented effectively. The result was that the city granted a taxi driver license to a man who was on the state sex offender registry and he raped a passenger. Now it's good that the Wichita City Council is concerned about human trafficking for the purposes of prostitution. But the response the council is considering, licensing a massage therapist, is not needed. We have strict laws already on the books that make human trafficking a serious criminal offense, and that's as it should be. The proposed Wichita regulations will simply make it more difficult for honest people to become massage therapists. Criminals will still continue to operate illegally. They're criminals, after all. Or they will easily obtain false credentials and then appear to be legitimate. The state of Kansas already has many burdensome occupational licensure requirements that limit economic opportunity and protect entrenched interests. And some of these requirements are puzzling. The proposed Wichita Massage Therapist requirement it requires more than twice as much education as is required to become an emergency medical technician. How does that make sense? And when we compare the proposed Wichita requirements to the rest of the states, we find that the Wichita standard is quite lax. 39 states license massage therapists with the average education or training requirement, requirement being 139 days. Wichita's proposing only 83 days, which might inspire one to ask this question. If the Wichita City Council is truly concerned about protecting Wichitans from getting a bad massage, why is it proposing such minimal requirements compared to other states? In reality, the high barriers to becoming a massage therapist in many states is testimony to the massage industry's success in erecting barriers to entry. By making it difficult to become a massage therapist, the supply is lower than it could be, and prices are higher. Consumers lose. 
As I said, city officials tell us that the existing local massage industry requested these regulations, and again, that's not surprising. The purpose of nearly all occupational licensure laws is to restrict entry to the industry so that existing practitioners can charge higher rates. That is a scam. A scam especially against low-income people that need a massage or a plumber. It is also a burden to people who want to become plumbers, barbers, massage therapists, or one of the many other licensed occupations. This is just another example of government focusing on the wrong things. And here's another. A few weeks ago, it was reported that seven people were arrested in Wichita for playing illegal poker. There had been a police inf investigation, it was reported. So if you've had trouble getting a cop in Wichita, it could be that the officers were busy protecting the city from the illegal playing of poker. Now this is an area overripe for reform. Why is playing poker for money on East Kellogg illegal? You know, at one time the state thought it had to protect us from gambling because it was sinful. And that argument has faded as states across the nation have sanctioned casinos. Kansas is unique, at least at the time of the start of non-Indian casino gambling in our state. Kansas was unique in that the casinos are actually owned by the state. So if the state of Kansas owns casinos, and if the state profits from casinos, how can the state object to gambling on any moral ground? Well, the answer is it can't object. And whatever the merits of the arguments against gambling, the state discarded them in exchange for money. Now the state continues to prohibit non-casino gambling because it's competition to Kansas state-sanctioned gambling that the state profits from. And while there is a statewide smoking ban in nearly all business establishments in Kansas, the state-owned casinos are exempted from the smoking ban. So is the state truly concerned about our health? Well, not while you're gambling in its state-owned casinos. Instead of devoting police, resor uh, police resources to serious problems like the child trafficking the Wichita City Council is concerned about, we have Wichita police officers devoting resources to investigating something that is legal just a few miles down the road in Sumner County. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. In our last segment, we talked about government regulation. And when seeking to understand the politics behind the formation of regulations, it's useful to be familiar with the theory of regulation known as bootleggers and Baptists. In this short video, Professor Bruce Yandel of Clemson University explains. See if you can see how this theory can be applied to Wichita and Kansas. Have you ever wondered why it is in many towns and cities and counties across the United States it's illegal for you to buy alcoholic beverages on Sunday, beer, wine, or liquor? But in those same places it's not illegal for you to drink alcoholic beverages on Sunday. The Bootlegger Baptist theory of regulation helps to explain why. The theory of bootleggers and Baptists is an attempt to explain features of government regulation. Not so much to explain the fact that government regulates, but that when government chooses to regulate, what kinds of characteristics do we find in the rules themselves? The name of the theory, in a sense, gives us some hints about what to expect. The theory has to do with coalitions of people who don't necessarily meet and organize, but who desire the same outcome. By closing down liquor stores on Sunday, the Baptists enjoy a diminution in the sale of alcohol at least one day a week, and so demon rum is off the streets as they see it. When those legitimate sellers are closed down, the bootlegger has a heyday. That's a day when the bootlegger can sell, and quite often the bootlegger buys the booze on Saturday from those legitimate sellers and then sells it on Sunday at a handsome profit. 
The bootlegger likes the restriction. The Baptist makes certain that it is enforced, and sometimes the bootlegger may pay off some of the authorities or some friendly politician who's running for office. Now we should notice that the restriction does not make the consumption of alcoholic beverages illegal on Sunday, just the sale, because the bootleggers would never support a law that says you can't drink alcoholic beverages on Sunday. Now we can take this theory and apply it in other settings. That is, the theory helps us to explain features of regulation that we might find anywhere, whether it has to do with alcoholic beverages, safety standards, or environmental rules and regulations. A common feature of U.S. environmental regulation is differential standards with respect to new sources of pollution and existing sources. Strict standards would have to be met by anyone building a new plant, whereas the old plant can just operate continuously the way it is. And there are two groups who favor that, and obviously, the owners of old plants love it. They don't have to meet the stricter standards, but their new competitors would. That restricts entry into their industry and makes their business more profitable. And environmentalists would obviously take the high ground and say, we need stricter standards. Certainly, when someone's building a new plant, they should have to use the latest technology. It's the environmentalists and the environmental organizations that do the heavy lobbying and make certain that the laws are passed and enforced. And then the industrialists can look forward to a more profitable time, now operating in a cartel that is managed in the U.S. case by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And so where does the bootlegger and Baptist theory take us and what might we expect in the future? I would suggest that any time we get new regulations and particularly in new areas, you will find the presence of bootleggers and Baptists. When you see new regulations, look for bootleggers and Baptists. That will help you to understand the features of the regulation that come into play.